just on who we are. In this particular slide, I want to show you the main features of the evaluation. I am hoping that most of you are aware of the National Rural Livelihoods Mission uh, as a program. Uh, the National it's, it's a flagship um, uh, program of the Government of India. Uh, as the importance is only increasing with the in increased focus on women self-help groups as a mechanism for, uh, for uh, poverty alleviation and social transformation. Um, uh, just to give, uh, put things in perspective, the, uh, the increasing importance of NRLF, uh, the budgetary outlay for this program has increased from uh, 5.8 thousand crores to 9 crores this year. Uh, between yeah, last year and this year. So yes, the fourth, so this is a very important program uh, uh, in, uh, started, which started by the, which was, it started off as a small pilot by the World Bank and then has grown to become a very large program that the government of India has owned. Um, so uh, given the, just the scope of the, of the program, this is, a, the scope of the evaluation is also large. In this slide, um, you can see that we are in our, our evaluation encompasses nine states, 27,000 households, 500 <coughs> SHGs, and 900 villages. Our mandate was to provide an average treatment effect of the NRLM program. Uh, this evaluation is a result of a partnership between 3 Ibruti, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Ministry of Rural Development, the World Bank, with Nielsen India being our partners in data connection. Um, our partnership is uh, really stepped up at each phase of an impact evaluation. Um, in each phase of the evaluation, all stakeholders work together as a team to bring this evaluation to its current stage. Right now, we are at the stage of the evaluation where we are close to completing data collection, and we will start analyzing the data soon. This is a great time for us to talk about what we have learned about doing impact evaluations. Um, uh, the method that we, uh, and I'll talk more about the methods very soon, but uh, based on the previous slide, what um, you, I just want to put it in the perspective that there is a debate if unbiased evaluation is better served when researchers work independently of the implementing program agency uh, to reduce conflict of interest. Indeed, there are possibilities of researchers to be influenced by implementing agencies not to mention possible participant bias arising in self-reported outcomes and thoughts and effects. My experience, however, working in the NRLM evaluation has been quite different. I rather think that this evaluation would have been biased and dull if we had not incorporated the rich experience of our partners at NRLM, SRLMs, and the World Bank at each state. Let me illustrate how with a few examples. So for each stage of an evaluation, I'm trying to give you some examples of what our expectations were, what was the reality, and how we found the solution. And you will see that none of this would have been possible if we were helicopter evaluators. Uh, the design phase. Our initial proposal was based, um, our initial research methodology was that of regression uh, discontinuity de uh, design. Uh, it was based on a survey of existing literature and process documents, which suggested that the implementation was done in a phased manner across blocks, with the poorest or the SCST majority blocks receiving the program first. So we proposed a re regression discontinuity design to our partners, uh, using the, where, the discontinu where we would use the ranking of poverty score ranking of a, a block to decide if it would be in the treatment group or in the control group. And this was promptly uh, you know, dismissed by our partners. After an intensive round of conversations at all levels, at the national level, at the state level, at the block level, we found that the phasing was not done at so much at the block level, but at the village level. Um, so while we could not, uh, could not work, uh, while we knew that the RDD would not work, we took, decided to take the advantage of a difference in different strategy using the two-step step phasing, um, uh, phasing method that, was, that, that we identified. We acquired and ver verified village implementation dates with block-level SRLM teams. And finally, we were sure that the phasing took place at the village level. 
Uh, next, we go on to the pre-analysis plan. The second assumption that, uh, that, uh, that, that was our assumption, that was challenged in the field, was that we would find only NRLM promoted SAGs if we focused on blocks and villages where NRLM was operating. In reality, there was a proliferation of non-NRLM SAGs which were doing different things, which could have been doing different things um, than uh, NRLM, which could confound the impact of NRLM itself. Our solution was, was to propose a sampling strategy that would include NRLM SAG members, non-NRLM SAG members, and non-SAG members. The tools, our expectation were that common schemes that we would be able to uh, collect information on common schemes and we expected that the structure of SAG federations would be similar across states. It was actually very different at the state, state level. Again, through an intensive round of discussion with the states, we, de we developed a flexible uh, questionnaire um, in, 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 uh, through computer-assisted uh, program, uh, and I really have to thank my colleagues in Nielsen for, for, for doing that. We understood about the structure of the federation. We haven't thought about the importance of federations until it was in a joint stakeholder uh, meeting that this the very important role of self-help federation BOs and CLS were brought to our mind. So we included those, incorporated those questionnaires with us. Um, going to the data collection phase where we are currently in, I have to state and I have to emphasize that any evaluation however good the uh, design may be, is only as good as the data used. We work with our partners to implement strong monitoring checks on the data, analyzing the data in real time. This helped the Nielsen team to take action in the field. One problem we encountered was the failure of SHG that we did not anticipate. Nearly 30% of sample SHGs were defunct by the time we reached the field. This created an initial hiccup but we were able to use the national MIS, which states the names of every uh, SAG member. So even if an SAG was defunct, we were able to identify uh, the X members. In this way, I, along with the fact that it helps us to answer the questions that we set out to answer, we will be able to answer a question that is relevant, but that did not arise in our pre-analysis plan. Why do SAGs fail? Based on our, the couple of examples that I shared with you, um, what are main learnings about doing large evaluations? First, partnerships are important. An evaluation will be useful and relevant if the experience of policymakers and implementing agencies who are the main users of its findings are incorporated. All too often, evaluations have focused on establishing causality without paying much attention to the questions that matter for decision making. And this has to be a dynamic process with constant feedback. In our case, our initial design would have been completely incorrect if we had not spoke, if we did not speak to the SRLM and our partners at the central level. Programs are complex and we must learn to embrace these. We have to use the complexities of programs to the advantage of the evaluation. There's too much richness of the experience to be thrown away in the drive for average treatment effects alone. In our case, we started working on studying the impact of SAG quality and SAG federations along with the impact of having or not having the program. Reporting heterogeneous effects are important if you want your study to be useful. The third finding, uh, and in this, I would like to point out that formative evaluations are go a long way. Formative evaluations can take the form of intensive field work, as our team has done, and we can be we can use qualitative methods of speaking to stack stakeholders and holding uh, you know conversations with enlightened participants. These can actually go a long way for towards uh, evaluation design. The developing a theory of change and verifying it in, in the field is another learning for us. There are several income, uh, outcomes where evidence is limited. 
that we were able to address in our evaluation, such as the impact of NRLM on income generating activities, the, in, the impact of federations on outcomes. Outcomes not focused, uh, these outcomes were not the focus at the planning stage. They're perhaps not a matter of focus even when, this, when developing the, the project appraisal documents. But these have become important now. As the NRLM is moving on to the next phase um, of wanting to create higher value um, economic activities and um, generating higher incomes for women, these are important changes in the causal link that we hope our evaluation will be able to address. So an evaluation may be used to direct um, outcomes that are not of focus at the planning stage, but which may be of in, uh, in interest later. Our evaluation can be used by decision makers to answer questions that will be important in phase two of any program. Of course, there, one has to be careful about the problem of overburdening an evaluation. <coughs> and uh, scope needs to be set right at the beginning. But we always have to think of an evaluation to answer questions that will come up in the future. Nimbleness to incorporate field realities. There's often a saying that, you know, it's fine if these are, these are aberrations in the field. And if, and, if, and if you have a large enough sample, it, the averages will take care of it. We don't agree with you. Our learning has not been such. Not all realities get every averaged out, even if and even if they do hide interesting stories. Or just to go back to our um, uh, to our question on um, SATs, go to our finding that uh, many some some of these SATs have gone defunct. We may well have chosen to brush it off, saying that no, these are just a handful of SATs. But the, but it wouldn't answer the next level of questions. Why do SATs go defunct? And what can we do to revive them? We are learning, and we are learning really fast. We're using the learnings to further strengthen this evaluation. We have intro introduced process level documentation. That as we went into the field, we realized that our questionnaires were not equipped to hold many complexities. So we included, so we have a robust MI system where instead we are capturing field realities, what we what we learned from fields from the field. And we plan to bolster our, bolster our findings with the help of qualitative research. In the end, I would like to make a pitch for uh, integrating complexities of the program, incorporating and forming partnerships with key stakeholders to make your evaluation robust and more relevant. This is uh, the most uh, recent evidence gap map uh, from 3IE. It, was, it has been made public today, as you can see. Uh, this gap map plots all the impact evaluation and systematic reviews that exist for each intervention and outcome. Uh, we, we collected this through a systematic search of published and unpublished uh, as well as um, you know, uh, uh, evaluation reports, journal papers evaluation reports for uh, agencies. Um, and we mapped what, what is the intervention that these, um, these uh, programs look at. So we, uh, we broadly categorized them as financial, financial and human, financial, social, financial, human, social, and others, human and social, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and we mapped the, them against what is the outcome that is being studied in this impact evaluation. So the gray dots show you the impact evaluations that study, say, financial uh, interventions, group-based livelihoods. So these are all group-based livelihoods interventions that provide financial access to financial capital. Included in these interventions are uh, you know, credit savings um, um, and uh, credit savings and other kinds of primary those. Uh, financial and human are all the ones that provide say, financial access to credit as well as skills training. So the bubble, the gray bubble shows you this number of impact evaluations that can be found on financial interventions and that looked at consumption and expenditure. If you go into these links, you will be able to access the studies that the impact evaluations that have uh, reported on what is the impact of 
financial uh, interventions on, um, on consumption. So that's how you read a map. What you can see here <coughs> is that there, ha there are some uh, significant gaps. For instance, there are, there are really very few studies that have uh, examined the impact of group-based livelihoods uh, interventions on migration. Similarly, on uh, diversification of income sources, this is an indicator of income generating activities. You'll see that very few that there are very few studies that have examined uh, these uh, this outcome. Um, and if you want, you could put all kinds of filters. So if you go here and you do India. If you put this filter, you will only get the studies that are that are for India. So here, this will actually give you the full range of SAG-related impact evaluations that are existing. You can access the, the papers and read them. Uh, associated with this gap map, this gap map is an online tool that you should be able to please use it and do give us uh, feedback on the same. Uh, associated with this is also a report which you'll find in our website. Please read it because it has a lot of details which the map may not be easily able to communicate to you. I guess some of the questions that I can already anticipate from, from the audience are what kind of interventions are included in financial interventions, what are human interventions. Uh, all of that is described in the report. There's a their detailed analysis of the evidence base there. You will also get the full range of all studies, uh, all impact evaluation and systematic reviews that have entered this gap map in, their appendix, in, in the appendices for your use. Um, you will also find systematic reviews that are in, that uh, that. Uh, systematic reviews that basically you know try to understand what the body of it, um, evidence says um, in the colored bubbles. So if so, if for instance you could say that there is one systematic reviews by Stewart and others which have looked at microcredit on uh, the impact of microcredit on savings, and that shows up as a bubble. If a green bubble shows a high quality systematic review, a red bubble shows low confidence systematic review, and uh, orange bubble shows a medium confidence system at you. Please use this resource, do read the uh, report, and we'll be very happy to answer any questions. You can get in touch with me uh, through email, and I'll be happy to respond to anything. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mani, for introducing, and thank you, Vidisha, for presenting the methodology and setting the uh, in setting uh, the set in the stage for what lies ahead. So um, thank you for also talking about the survey instruments. So I'll be talking more on uh, the sampling strategy and our key learnings from being uh, uh, involved uh, since the start in our intense discussion and uh, interviews with the state and block level uh, project implementing stuff. So, uh, so our yeah. So uh, the NRLM was introduced at uh, block level. So a set of blocks was selected at the start of the program, <coughs> and uh, another set of um, blocks were left to be in, uh, I mean introduced to the SAG program, the NRLM program at a later stage. So a district at the onset of uh, the program had early implementing blocks, late implementing blocks, and uh, blocks which are non which have not yet um, been introduced to the program. So uh, our purpose uh, and our methodology exploits the phasing of uh, the program across villages and also across the block. So our difference in difference comes from there. Now, uh, uh, selecting and uh, implementing block and, and, and taking a control sample from non-implementing block creates its own problems. The non-implementing blocks are different from the implementing blocks. Non-implementing blocks are supposed to have a toned-down version of the program uh, called the non-intensive implemented in a non-intensive approach. So we had to 
uh, narrow down our sample to only early and late implementing blocks. Now, uh, the program is being implemented at the cluster level. So block is further divided into three to four clusters which have villages under them. And each uh, cluster has its own staff. So a, a set of outcomes that are realized by villages in cluster one of a block can be different from set of out outcomes realized in cluster two. Now, uh, the fee, uh, our sample had to come from uh, a, a number of clusters within the blocks. Now, the phasing, uh, the clusters are identified only in the implementing blocks and are not identified in the non-implementing blocks. So we cannot choose our sample of villages from non-implementing blocks. Yeah, so. Uh, for this, to choose which blocks are early implementers and late implementers, which villages are early and which are late, we had to depend heavily on our national MIS, the NRLM MIS being maintained at the national level. We needed information on start of blocks in density, uh, implementing partners, number of SAGs within villages, and number of SAGs within the cluster. So. Our data requirement was this, uh, but we needed data on clusterization of blocks as well. Now, and a determinant of the phasing of the villages within those clusters. We, we, got, we got most of the data from the national MIS, and we collected the first round of data on implementation at block level. We narrowed down to blocks which had uh, which had sufficient phasing between the, the start of uh, the program. Uh, we, we tried to maximize uh, the duration and the gap between them. Um, we took uh, the early implementing blocks that were implemented in the, uh, at the onset of the program, majorly 2003, and the late implementing comes from 2017. We restricted, then we selected all eligible early and late implementing blocks and then uh, collected data on each and every SAG within that block. Uh, we needed uh, uh, data on how the villages were phased on observed characteristics within those clusters. Uh, it, it needs to be noted that the national MIS did not have required, all required data. It did not have data on uh, the phasing of the villages. It did not have data on the clusterization of blocks. So this needed to, uh, to be followed up at block level and state level uh, to, uh, to collect this data. Now, uh, we also use this opportunity to also verify the national level data, so just so as to strengthen our strategy. Uh, data on clusterization on, of blocks was collected uh, from the block staff. However, this data was not available in ready to use form. We, it, it lied in hard copies and we had to code and collected from each and every block. Uh, what we did was that um, uh, we had uh, state coordinators in each and every state uh, who, were, who were in uh, on continuous uh, discussion and continuous partnership with uh, state and block level staff. Uh, this also provided us immense learning on uh, the heterogeneity uh, in the way the program was implemented implemented across the states. Uh, there were presence of uh, uh, early SEGs in late dated blocks because of de uh, block delimitation since uh, the program launch. It's been nine years since the program has launched and a lot of blocks have had been delimited, which we had to take care of otherwise we would, uh, otherwise that would uh, out of SEGs that were formed under SGSY that were still functioning um, there were SAGs that were co-opted and revived under an ILM, uh, and we had to take care of that as well. We need to be sure that uh, those SAGs are not functioning differently than our in ILM SAGs. Um, now I'll talk about how to verify the data and how uh, it was done. So uh, we had rigorous discussions and interviews with uh, state and block level staff. Uh, 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 we, uh, we 
uh, discuss about the program, start how the phasing of the program did take place. We also did uh, use as opportunity to talk about how the community resource person, persons who are the ones who make those SAGs work in each and every cluster of the block, who they were, where they came from, and how the how they formed the SAG. This really helped us to make our survey instruments robust to handle all kinds of uh, complexities of the field. Uh, the, um, see, this was not an easy process and we had to uh, go and visit each and every uh, block, uh, not once but more. Uh, it also required contextualization of, uh, of verification. The SAGs that were created in Rajasthan were very different than the SAGs that were created in Odisha. Also, uh, the, the way the, uh, the program was phased out in, say, a block X of uh, Uttar Pradesh was very different than the way the program was uh, phased out in another block of the same state. So, um, while going through all this, we, uh, we realize that a lot of institutional knowledge gets lost due to frequent change of staff because either they are uh, because of attrition or being or because they are transferred. Our key learnings from this entire uh, uh, engagement at block level and other levels as well, and uh, the selection of sample was that that it uh, we need to invest time in building rapport with the project staff. It helps to lay a strong foundation and ground for the evaluation. It helps strengthening the evaluation at each and every process, uh, process stage. Uh, there is a need for improved process documentation at the lowest possible level. Uh, this is to preserve that institutional knowledge that how the program was launched and how are these SAGs formed. This also helps in uh, program, uh, not just the evaluation, but also program, uh, the way the program is being implemented. Uh, Usage of, so since we were using the MIS data, it was administrative in nature. It requires a lot of basic patience and verification. It also needs contextualization for different states uh, if there are heterogeneities in implementation. Uh, support from senior officials is crucial and we are very thankful to MORD and uh, the World Bank for uh, providing uh, support at each and every uh, uh, step to uh, help us carry out this evaluation. Also, as Bidisha said, that uh, the evaluation methodologies need uh, that nimbleness. It has to, it has to be robust to accommodate the complexities of the field, more so in cases like uh, NRLM, where the program is being implemented all across India and uh, with different forms. Thank you. So, uh, can I start uh, with you, uh, Lena, uh, as uh, the mission director for uh, NRLM? You've heard now about uh, uh, what's going on in terms of how the evaluation is uh, is being implemented. Uh, could you tell us, from your perspective, what are the opportunities uh, that you see uh, that can help uh, you in your work? Uh, also, what are challenges that the researchers you think uh, have to grapple with uh, in the future. First of all, thank you for giving us an opportunity to listen to uh, both Vidisha and Rohan. And they have brought out the vastness of the program. Although I would say that this is, we, we can't say this is a national assessment because most of the states which have been selected are northern states. Southern states have been left out, maybe because, as we all know, that the uh, AYNRLM evolved as a result of learnings from southern states, where the SAG movement had really grown, uh, taken root, shown results, and that is why people thought that as a concept of proof, it was possible to replicate it in uh, poorer states, which are mainly northern or uh, states and these nine states which have been selected are primarily those. So the rider is there, but yes, it is definitely a learning because from the size of the sample, 
uh, uh, SAGs and 900 villages. So this is really large scale. And uh, I think World Bank and uh, gave us an opportunity as a end line learner. It was like a deliverable that a study has to be conducted. So I think it gave us an opportunity in disguise to learn uh, what what we are doing, how we are implementing, and how it is going to shape up. So that from these learnings, from these studies, we understand that okay, what is what is what we are doing will work, and what has to be reshaped, rethought, uh, with re both with regard to program implementation guidelines, etc. So this was. One very interesting thing which uh, is very crucial for us and for NRLM, I think at the national level, it will be a great learning, whatever, despite of this initial, uh, these nine selection of these nine states. So you have, uh, once the findings will come out, I think uh, depending on the um, outcomes, what we, what come out, despite of the bias of northern states, I think it will be a learning pan India uh, because we know the certain states where they have performed what has worked there, but it will bring a national perspective to it definitely. And I think this study will get a wider acceptance also if we calibrated these learnings with the southern maybe some studies which are, which have been done in this uh, for the southern states or the earlier states which have done this. And I would say that the rigor. Uh, the statistical rigor which was with which the study has been done which has been clearly brought out by both of them I think that is remarkable we had couple of issues but as Vidisha has pointed out we had time and again I joined in uh, October so I realized that this is a study which is going on and there are some issues in sample collection when initially it was the questionnaire framing and uh, let me tell you, it is three to four hours which you question uh, an individual. So even if somebody asked me, I would say, no, please. <laughs> it's nice, but thank you. But I think if they have been able to gather a lot of important data for us with this extensive questionnaire, which, has, which will give us outcomes, outputs, both. So it will be great learning. And uh, the team, Bruti, Triyai, and... Uh, uh, professor from Stanford who will be writing this, uh, all these assessments and all these learning data collector, post data collection, I think that would add to the credibility of the study per se and its acceptance also, wider acceptance. And uh, and, uh, all, I, I, and again, uh, all the stakeholders, what she mentioned that if you do uh, a, a program division or a department of a ministry or anybody this, uh, gives a, a study to an organization or to a couple of people together and that's it without any active engagement at all levels. So I think it would be a very cut and dry studies. Maybe it will be good for the book uh, uh, bookish knowledge that okay you have adhered to what we have studied in statistics, how the studies are done, whether it is DID or whatever uh, sampling or control group, non-control group, etc., etc. But then it would not have the uh, bring in the learnings which are which uh, the concerned organization is looking for. Where there is uh, in this case, I think it has been redressed because time and again they have come back to us. We have also shared our anxiety because there was a time where data collection was not happening to the desired extent or the quality with which we are asking them. There were a lot of uh, like casual uh, data inputs from number of your uh, uh, people in Nielsen. As a result, we had to do some training also. We had to say, okay, you will have to take these people off. You have to bring new people, whether you have to take it or not. And again, I must uh, full credit to them that despite of the model code of conduct, they were able to do this. So hats off to them because that's a tough time to carry on with your activity. Uh, and uh, uh, they 
because of and that time was utilized to identify the gaps the shortcomings and to redress them whether it was by training or retrenching people who were not up to it and then get, uh, getting a feedback and data cleaning the data and analyzing it so that one understood okay where was the fault it has been addressed now at least the data which will come up for analysis will be good enough for the final outcome so i think this these were the these are the opportunities and i would say that uh, it will be a great learning for nrlm dai nrlm post the learnings which come to us Thanks very much uh, for that perspective, uh, Lena. I think it's going to be really useful for uh, for, for, for for the team. Um, I have another question for you, but I'll hold off until I hear actually from uh, Gayatri on her perspective as uh, someone who uh, is responsible for overseeing uh, some of the support that the World Bank has been giving to this program. Again, same question, what do you see are the opportunities for the bank as a whole to learn in its programs? And uh, what the international community can get from this? And from what you heard, what are some of the challenges that uh, you empathize with as a team grapples with the methodology? Thank you very much, thank you. Um, and, oh, thanks very much for this opportunity. Uh, one thing I want to just acknowledge, because I think it's a very important point that uh, Joyce Lina Jaria just made, which is that the partners that we so consistently forget to acknowledge and mention are the households that sit for three and four hours answering yeah. these questions. Because that was the question I asked them too. Is it, are you yes. kidding? You are asking them four hours yes. to give you time? They have a number of activities to do. I think they definitely are the, the most important partners in all of this exercise because without them there is no program and there is certainly no evaluation. Um, to reflect on this, I think the importance of uh, doing the impact evaluation is always, I think, much greater than the results that come out of the impact evaluation. Right? The process of actually conducting the evaluation, thinking through what are the questions we want to ask? What are the impacts we expected? And what are the impacts we think we're going to be able to see at this point? These are the most, this is the most critical part of carrying out the evaluation. One may end up through this process deciding that, sorry, the intentions were there to do an evaluation, but we can't do it. And that's also okay. So from the perspective of the bank, the, the, the intention to evaluate is extremely important. So that one creates the enabling environment to carry out an evaluation whenever we can. I personally think that we don't have enough evaluations um, of this kind, this, this nature, where we're looking at a program that has um, been on the ground for a very long period of time and where bits and pieces have actually been evaluated. As you said uh, in, other, in, in certain earlier programs, there have been various evaluations done. So what do we have now? We have the opportunity to have this much larger scale evaluation over a much greater period of time, and it's highly unusual that we have this kind of opportunity. I think it's great that we, if we come to the end of this thing, the question that you just raised um, has given me this also this idea that actually we should, at some point, revisit all of the evaluations that have been done for the NRLM and see if there's a, a different story to weave out of that. So not to discount anything that has been done before, but to really take the strength of this evaluation and, and bring in uh, the history as well. So the bank certainly finds um, evaluation very important. Uh, not just to do confirm, yes, the design was right and we did the right thing and we put the financing in the right place. That's uh, that's sort of the cherry on the on the cake, let's say, right? It's the icing on the cake that if, if um, the evaluation shows that the design was right and the impacts were good, that's super. What's really important for us as an institution is that the commitment to evaluate means that you're going to also have to commit to good MIS to good monitoring data, to ensuring that your program is carried out in a disciplined way so that we are able to maintain control groups. Those types of um, elements of doing an impact evaluation is extremely critical um, for, for, for us. Um, 
one one final point, if I may, is that there there is um, an interesting point that one of you raised just now, which uh, just to do with the robustness and the nimbleness of how we we do evaluations. So I think there's a creative tension there between ro robustness and nimbleness. And I think it's something that, as a community, we have to debate a bit more as to what constitutes uh, robustness when you are looking for a nimble evaluation. It's not, it, it's not entirely clear that um, you can maintain the same level of robustness. It's also not clear to me that robust evaluations can't be more nimble. So we have to really question this uh, as, a, as a community. So I would really welcome a lot of learning in that area. Great, thanks. Um, before I turn it over to uh, to you to, to respond, Lucia uh, and, and Ron, uh, maybe if I might turn back to you and just looking ahead, um, you know, not everyone likes to be evaluated. I know I didn't when I was doing this, so certainly when we had final exams and we were students, so it's always an issue. So my question to you is, um, are there any uh, lessons that uh, you might have for the team on how you communicate and bring people on board so that they're more open to what may be difficult lessons, perhaps, that could come out of this evaluation. A anything that they could do right now to help prepare, to make sure that the recipient of the lessons would be open to uh, changing the way they do things. Can, can you mug in on that last bit? No, no. Uh, that, uh, sometimes people don't uh, have a closed mind about evaluations or that uh, you know, this is a very large program already, and they may feel uh, a little bit concerned uh, about what it might mean for them. But you brought up the fact that it's very important to learn, and, and is, is there a balance that has to be struck? Uh, and, and what are lessons for the team as they try to communicate uh, uh, what um, these lessons? We don't know what they are yet, but some of them may be hard. Are there lessons for the team to take forward? I think uh, the evaluations are tough, but then they have to keep on happening. As you say, the first evaluation, all of us went through all the exams. So, uh, but then that was necessary to reach the next ladder. So I think, and if we say DAYL, I think the evaluations are good because they are like course correction. Uh, they help us to uh, in course correction, mid course correction also like we have initial, mid-course, and end of the uh, <coughs> program studies. So these are very critical because we cannot rest on our laurels, one. And any program, whatever time it is conceived, designed, may look whatever, however good, howsoever good, has to uh, encounter some roadblocks, some successes, some failures. Uh, because the, as we see India, it's such a diverse country. <coughs> Every area, like if we see Northeast, it has got a different ecosystem, how we implement program that uh, in those areas where bank linkages are not so uh, spread out, or uh, tribal areas where it would be very different communication, access to road, markets, it's livelihood. So how do you make the uh, livelihoods, whether it is farm or non-farm, those products reach, reach the market? So I think evaluations are good because they help in help us in stock taking, uh, addressing our knowing our strengths. Okay, these are good because that impels you to work harder because to see that okay at least some things were in place and you need to consolidate on them quickly. The shortcomings, whether it springs from policy framework, it uh, it is because of. Uh, differences, like in differences and differences, you said this is one program, but different states would be having different uh, implementing agency. Where somewhere the funds might be flowing right from the state to the CBO, or they may be state district block to the CBO. Uh, so uh, it helps you. And I think the agencies, uh, for the agencies, I think it's a learning thing because I think four hours questionnaire is a bit tough. I think we need to sit and rationalize it and understand that uh, our basic instrument to collect data should be such that it is agreeable both to the participant and the person who is uh, 
doing that, uh, the researcher. So otherwise it becomes a, like if I have to take <coughs> data from 10 participants today and maybe another 20 next, I would feel so, oh my God, this is a very boring task. And you would lose the interest. Uh, so that, uh, like for co quantitative data and qualitative data, there are different aspects. Whereas one, if you are crunching numbers, it is fine. But this, if a program which is socially uh, impinging on the societal change, on livelihoods, on poverty eradication, participation, political participation through gram panchayats, you need to be more sharp in your reflexes or in your understanding. If some lady is saying, okay, this, this means this, uh, this would mean. So all those attributes, all those responses have to be recorded very carefully and in detail. So that is, that was one thing which I was like appalled, if I may say, I told, I asked my team, like, Desaki is there, she, first I would listen to her, then I asked just casually that, okay, how long is your interview? She said, four hours, my, I said, <laughs> then you are really doing a fantastic job if you have designed such a huge thing uh, and agreed to roll it out. So that is one. Then the lessons which we have learned that the people who are given, uh, the task to actually data collect the data they should be collected uh, they should be selected more carefully they should their strengths should be understood so that like we should not lose time sending them taking a feedback understanding okay what they did was right what was or they are not doing as you have desired so that means the initial selection has not been right so that delays the studies that create friction also within your own team, with your partners, with us also, we would have got tough on you. We had a couple of meetings uh, in March <coughs> in which we said that, okay, like, okay, you see the data, you come back within a week, clean the data, look at the data. So unpleasantness should not be part of studies, I would say, that uh, it should be more careful where one should be more careful when such a huge scale of data is being collected and the program is being assessed and evaluated because see this uh, whatever be the feedbacks which come to us so this four hour or three hour as Gayatri mentioned would would I think there would be a impact there also how truthfully that uh, rea response of the beneficiary has been recorded in the uh, thing. so these were the few things but I at the end of it I still say that whatever be the outcome these uh, uh, assessments have to be there because otherwise we would be self glorifying ourselves that we have done a good job and at the end of the uh, day any program we have to take it to a higher level and this has to address the poverty of the people for whom this program is being rolled out so that has to be kept in mind and that cannot be done till this assessment and re-evaluation keeps on happening Periodic uh, That's really great to hear to have that openness uh, that, that you have. But I, I did also hear that you said that uh, when we do this, uh, be very when we evaluate, we have to be constructive uh, in the message. And, and the other very important point that both of you raised is bring it back not just to the program implementers, but to beneficiaries themselves. They want to know what did they got out of their four hours that they that they spent. And that's a very interesting thought. Um, Gaiji, I had one follow-up question for you. you. You mentioned that the process of doing the evaluation was as important as the outcome. I was wondering from your experience at the bank or elsewhere, can you give us a little bit more uh, of an indication of what is it about the process that you think is so important? And why is it that having an IE will help actually the program itself even if there were no results. So first, first point over there is that the, the willingness of the partner, that for, for us the, the governments we finance, the willingness to be open to assessments, as you've just indicated, Lina, is absolutely critical. Why? Because that means that we can actually start to design programs with meaningful results or expectation of meaningful results. And what I mean by the process being very important is that 
it's it's important for us to understand right from the start what we're trying to measure and how we would go about measuring it. Now, some of the, the points that you've raised about these very uh, cumbersome uh, surveys, the whole process, as Disha and um, uh, Rohan, you've pointed to, the whole process of, of uh, course correction, thinking that we wanted to do X and we had to do Y, and we find the justifications, and that's part of being um, engaged as a, as a full community, right? Full development community, not just um, uh, not, not just evaluators, but also implementers. You have to be part of that conversation. The importance of, I think, having these conversations up front is that the more administrative data you can rely on, the easier it becomes to, to actually do the final surveys that, that uh, you would depend on for your impact evaluation. And this is always a weakness, which uh, no particular uh, entity's fault or, or such, but projectization takes place when, say, we come in to finance something, and we can help, you know, help to push on improving MIS and administrative service, etc., during the course of the program. But what would be even better, which I think we have, to, we have over here, is that we've got a program that the government finances, and we're an itty-bitty partner in it, actually, even though we very kindly said that we encouraged you to do an end line. Um, actually, we're, we're a small partner. The government is the big partner. And so if, if the government is open to improving the way in which data is collected over time and learns from whatever painful experiences or, or good experiences we've been going through now, that's the value addition that we would be looking for. Um, because none of us are in this for the short run. We're in this for the big impacts, not just the impacts on the households that we survey, but the overall system effects that not, uh, these types of programs are expected to deliver on. Thanks. So what I hear is that the evaluation actually imposes a certain discipline on both the implementers as well as the financiers to be aligned on the objectives and to make sure that uh, uh, they're agreed on. Uh, on, on. And if I may mention just one, this one, sure. one little example from another country where uh, I recall uh, presenting early results from an impact evaluation on, to to their um, equivalent of their planning commission. You know, the results were okay. They were no great shakes, but they were okay. They were positive. They were fair effects. But what was really amazing by it, through that process was the negative effects on the control, the, the negative outcomes for the control, and all the policymakers were completely taken by that. It didn't matter about this program, which again was a small thing, but they were really amazed that the control had suffered so much during this entire period. So they, the question they asked themselves was, "What is it we're doing wrong everywhere else? You know, there's something wrong with all the other programs we're working on." That in itself was a useful discussion. Great. Unintended consequences. Um, if you might think about what questions you want to ask, but uh, think about that while I ask uh, Bidisha and Rohan to reflect on uh, the comments. I agree with uh, Lina Madden that you know, this has been a very long questionnaire. Uh, but for us, is actually the outer limit. Uh, and we were aware, because we were aware of you know, the opportunity cost that we are imposing on our participants who are poor rural women. We actually went about uh, trying to design our interviews in a manner that we don't waste so much of their time. So certain mechanisms that we allowed them to do were things like we don't expect them to be sitting with us all through the four, four hours. They can go about their work and we will follow them where they go. Uh, respecting the, the the participants in in, a, in an interview is really important for us. Uh, but having said that, you know, I completely take your feedback on board that four hours is could be overwhelming for someone. It also gets a bit fatigue. There's a bit of a fatigue that sets in for the interviewer, who f perhaps may you know, okay, you know, this is just taking too long for me. Um, let me just give up. But I think for that, the right kind of incentive needs to be set up by the survey agency. So to get their um, you know, productivity right, to get their productivity estimates right, these are important implications on costs. 
Um, and perhaps one way to get a, get around doing it is to understand, and ma'am, you touched upon it, I really appreciate that, that, you know, the capability that a researcher has in eliciting responses from, uh, from, from, from a participant may be vastly different from that what an average uh, survey from, uh, you know, interviewer me. Those are things that need to be certainly assessed right at the, we, I, we have learned that that has to be assessed at the beginning of the interview, of, of rolling out a data collection exercise, not, not after or not midway. Certainly we'll be careful okay. about it um, uh, in, in the future. Uh, Manny, you uh, spoke about uh, you know how we would communicate these learnings, uh, not only uh, you know to people here at the center, I'd like to say, but also to the people um, at the field. Um, we are doing that constantly. We have a system through which uh, you know write down. We try to ensure that uh, through Nielsen. We try to ensure that you know the, every every learning that we have on the field is communicated to the lowest level of uh, of, of survey agents, um, and that has been that has of course you know somewhere I've also seen that if you have long chains of communication and somewhere down the line you know the message like it's like a game of Chinese whisper, so you know you start with something else and the, at the end the person at the end of the chain learns something completely different. Uh, so, um, but I think that does not mean that we should stop. The idea is to communicate, 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 and at some point it will register. Right. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, on the, um, given the vast expanse and um, by the uh, outcomes that the uh, DAY and ILM is touching, uh, and uh, the um, the wide uh, array of outcomes that are going to get, uh, uh, reflect, I mean, uh, affected by the program. Uh, the, the question is, uh, we tried to incorporate, I mean, we had to incorporate the complexities and, uh, I mean, address all the heterogeneities across the state. It, um, the, the survey states uh, lie from the east coast to the west coast of India, so uh, we had to incorporate everything of that. Um, but yeah, I do agree that uh, a certain level of fatty and there's a there's an opportunity cost, as Pratisha said, uh, to the enumerators for sitting through the four hours. But I'm I'm, I'm very thankful to the needs team and the, the the households who are responding to our question, and uh, <coughs> we are able to get uh, uh, as good data as we I, of uh, good quality data through this. Um, on uh, lessons on how are they communicated back, uh, not only to the um, to the key uh, stakeholders here, but also to the staff. Uh, the, uh, this is being done uh, through uh, Nielsen and also our uh, set of people on the ground. Uh, as soon as a survey um, block is being completed, or a, a block has completed the survey, we. The, we get in touch with the block stuff and the lessons that we learn through uh, the implementation of the survey is communicated back. Uh, we have had uh, 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 workshops with our state uh, representatives before uh, the program, uh, before the survey was rolled out and we had uh, taken their buy-in on all the factors and uh, we can certainly plan such a similar exercise uh, 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 later on as well to communicate those findings. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me now open it up. We have about uh, 25 minutes uh, for uh, uh, questions and, and answers. You could identify yourself, and then if you, if you have a, a question that is addressed to one member of the panel, please say so. Obviously, everyone just say that as well. And please keep the questions short uh, because we have a, a short of time. So, Thank you. Um, actually, I did want the indulgence of the chair to spend a minute on before the question. Um, I'm Dean Agarwal. I'm professor of um, development economics at the University of Manchester, and um, I'm one of those people who actually worked in the in, uh, in on group approaches uh, to women's livelihood in the South in Andhra Pradesh and, and Kerala. I finished a several papers and a very large study looking at group farming and productivity and the implications for women. Um, 
And um, <coughs> that's so. I wanted to say, take a minute on the kind, the very different kind of data that I collected for that, which was weekly data for every input and output for a sample of group and individual farms for an entire year for for every input, which means every kind of labor, hired another, um, and so on, um, for 763 farm enterprises in uh, uh, Andhra, 216 Kerala. Uh, I didn't have a huge um, foundation behind me, but yes, NRLM was one of the funders for the Kerala project. Um, and so um, this is a very different kind of group. SHGs would be an image. A kind of SAG one could say, say, in credit linked to banks is a kind of starting point, but they're not simply SAGs um, yeah, because they go into group enterprises. Um, and we also did focus group discussions for everybody um, uh, as well, plus interviewing why the program was launched, how it was structured, why it was structured in battery, and so on. So it is possible to actually collect very, very, very detailed data. Um, if you really want robust um, uh, assessments of economic outcomes, among other things. Um, so my questions really arise from that, because it, um, it wasn't clear to me. Thank you for the presentations, and you had a lot to present, I know. Um, but what exactly are these SAGs doing? I mean, we know what basically what SAGs are. But uh, I thought one of the conversations over the past seven, eight, ten years is that do you use SAG as a starting point to form groups which could then lead to innovative livelihood programs? Um, and many of these would be group enterprises. Now I know that there's a huge World Bank study, I think it was the Andhra SAG that was done, um, looking at poverty, impact on poverty of uh, SAG members and non-SAG members. That must have been about 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, so so if uh, what are these SAGs doing? What exactly are you evaluating? Wasn't, wasn't clear to me. What are the questions you're asking them? Um, why are you talking to households uh, only rather than to groups? Because surely you can always do a household survey and somebody is a member of a group and not a member of a group and, and various other characteristics. But the reason why we ask SAGs is because a group is more than, than just the individual women. Um, and so I was surprised not to have you say, or maybe you've done it and, and, and we haven't heard is uh, did you do um, group interviews with the SAGs? Uh, how do they function? Uh, what are their, uh, what do they do jointly? Uh, what are the problems? Uh, are there any collective action problems? Um, and so on. And then federations are important because they provide the spine. Now that's, you're absolutely right that federations are key. I found that in Andhra, I found that in Kerala. So they are the, uh, the institutional um, structure around which you can have sustainable um, group enterprise through SAGs. Um, so uh, one-time only interviews, um, again, I was just curious why you're doing only one-time only interviews. Um, so all of those were questions. Um, if you could say, what kind of data are you collecting as well? Okay. Thanks. Let me take a couple of other questions so over here. Please identify yourself. Yeah. My name is Victor. I work at PwC in the social sector advisory. Uh, well, uh, to the uh, research team, uh, this query is that while we have an abundance of data in South India, which led, well, led to the start of an in some sense of the world, and uh, we are doing it in North India, but why is a hill, ma'am pointed out, Ms. Julie pointed out, the northeastern states, the, where the mission is also going on, the Seven Sisters or Himachal or Uttarakhand, where the problems are quite different and varied, apart from these, which are more a plain sort of a thing where the density of population is more will find more groups or views per, uh, what was the decision that uh, led you to uh, sort of exclude these states from your research? Uh, over here? Sorry, if you could use the microphone. I can be louder. Uh, no, but the uh, people overseas can't hear you. Is it on? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Anand from Oxford Policy Management. I have a question with three parts, and I'll try and be as short as I can. Sorry. So the first question is, uh, I think it's also uh, based on what was said. What is the evaluation going to measure? Uh, you know, are there uh, certain indicators that the evaluation is focused on? Uh, second is, uh, given the complexity of the program and the uh, varied geography that the program is looking across, which have different timelines, 
the stakeholders not uh, I wonder I wonder if stakeholders didn't think qualitative data collection to complement the quantitative impact evaluation was important. And lastly, how do stakeholders here think this evaluation is going to help uh, inform the policy around building building sustainable values in India and our NRS program? Okay, thanks. Why don't we stop there for now? We're going to take another round. So, uh, a lot of the questions were about the methodology and, the, and really the, the research questions, so you didn't have time. So, if you could answer that. But I think uh, uh, both for you, Lena, and perhaps Guy, there was a question there about what does it mean for policy uh, in general? Um, I think. We, if, maybe we can just wait for that. Okay. Um, so, quickly responding to Professor Agarwal, I mean, I'm sorry I didn't really touch. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, we do ask questions. Uh, not, our uh, focus is not only the households. So like I said, you know, we will be fielding, we are, we are doing 5,000 self-help group uh, interviews with 5,000 self-help groups. Um, around uh, 300 uh, VOs, and if they are connected, then around 100 um, cluster level federations or their equivalent in depending state wise. Um, and the question, um, so even within the household, we have a questionnaire which is meant for the household. And then there is a questionnaire for women in particular, where we want to know about her, in, you know, her own asset holding, a woman's own asset holding, her, her income, her financial independence. Um, as well as her fertility decisions. So all these outcomes that we eventually mapped out was based on uh, the theory of change, you know, which, which was revised multiple times and we had to incorporate a number of, uh, you know, things which were on the, in the field. Otherwise, we would have a very staid uh, impact evaluation where we look at impact of uh, NRLM on outcomes, consumption and expenditure. Um, we tried to do something beyond. So um, our hope was that we would be able to understand what is group dynamics, hence the circle group questionnaires. We hope that income generating activities, we know that at this, the, at its current stage, um, you know, the focus has been, uh, the focus of NRLM has primarily been to support the groups, to bring the groups, uh, to stabilize the groups and to give uh, women some amount of credit, access to credit and some amount of, you know, income. The next step is going to be providing them with, you know, the you know, you know, the necessary uh, you know inputs to start group activities. So we have something on groups, and like I mentioned in my uh, when I started off, that the evaluation has to think of what would be important in the future, and these are the questions that would be important in the future: income generating activities, group activities, group businesses are going to be important. So, uh, so this, so, so we started off with. So we included all of that in our in our questionnaire. Um, so does that kind of answer your question on what we are uh, what we are measuring? So we are measuring economic outcomes. We are uh, we are measuring non-economic so social cohesion, social interaction outcomes, as well as uh, you know empowerment re related uh, outcomes. Uh, you know we 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 interview women on uh, self-efficacy, on their uh, political participation, on their uh, community level participation. Uh, no wonder, you know, we have uh, such a long questionnaire. It was required of to have a holistic look at the program. Given that the program itself has so many ways in which it can change, it can bring about change in household and women's lives, uh, we, uh, you know, we decided to incorporate it all in our study. Uh, so yeah, so I think it's a pretty extensive questionnaire, a lot of in outcomes and, uh, in uh, you know, that would be of interest and I'll be happy to share the questionnaires with anyone for uh, finer details. Uh, on the qualitative study, yes, we are thinking about fund, we are thinking of a complementary qualitative study, understanding that there have been, um, you know, that there are differences across states, so that is something in the plans. Uh, we took a while uh, to roll to roll out the qualitative studies because uh, 
well, we wanted the qualitative study to be truly complementary to our quantitative study. So the idea is to not just ask the same questions that we are already getting in our quantitative uh, data collection. Now that we have an idea about what the what our data are looking, we know where our gaps are, and that's exactly where we are going to be funding the qualitative work. Yeah. Well, I think to add, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so to add on um, Bidisha regarding the institutional uh, uh, and uh, innovative livelihood projects, our question is, seem to have uh, a varied uh, level of, I mean, uh, varying questions on also to measure not only the group level outcomes, but also the village level outcomes, like how these SEGs are functioning within villages, are they strengthening the uh, the delivery mechanisms are, are they able to bring forward the preferences of the, the those poor households um, in in the gram panchayat and gram sabha meetings uh, to to answer the question about why uh, the northeast indian uh, states states uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, the hilly and the northeast states so the mandate was majorly to evaluate uh, the program, um, may, uh, was to uh, evaluate the National Rural Livelihood Project that was being funded by the bank. And uh, the set of villages that were, are uh, the villages that we are uh, evaluating in this round of examples. There are only a certain number of states that are financed through the World Bank. Okay. Maybe take this out for a okay. Uh, Lena? Uh, yeah. So maybe just your question, I would just maybe, I'm just hypothesizing that maybe these, as uh, Gayatri pointed out, 13 states where, are, where World Bank has held for NRLD and NRLM also primarily there. So maybe that was the reason. In Northeast and Hilly states, the program is taking, is being rolled out, but the strength of the program is not so deep that we can take some lessons from them. Maybe another five years, I think it should happen. We would have selective uh, study for Northeast also to understand and to address the issues that are being faced. So uh, how this would help us, as I said, that it would help us in course correction with uh, all these learnings which would come from, the, uh, from this study and help us in identifying the facilitating and the deterring factors both so that we can address them both vis-a-vis -vis the livelihood activities both farm and non-farm what is working how we need what we need to streamline so like currently we are trying to upscale focus on uh, higher level of economic activity through value chain market linkage maybe this is because of the assessment that okay some uh, growth has happened and there are groups or there are SHGs or there are individuals who have organized themselves into enterprise or producer groups, farmer <coughs> producer groups or enterprise and they need other, other supporting and enabling environment wherein we are bringing value chain and market linkages, uh, aggregation, farm gate, all those things. Then there is a whole aspect of financial inclusion which Vidusha also mentioned. It's just not social inclusion, IBCD and all the goody goody things that women get together, get an opportunity to sit, share their issues and then go back. But this is higher than that. They save, they uh, open an account in the bank, they access loan through RF, CIF and then they access formal credit. So this learning about the financial inclusion will be great uh, learning for us because we have to understand that how these financial strategies have to be deepened or can be reworked or we have to understand that uh, what should be the quantum of loan which is appropriate for activities uh, the how, whether what what are the number of what is the uh, number of people who are taking a loan through formal credit uh, banking system and then all these vo clf and shgs we have to understand that what is the strength of the institution. Like you encountered the couple of SHGs which you found that they had become defunct. But then you went back to the MIS database and pulled out the uh, member details. So where you mapped it, okay, this, even if it is defunct, but that member is still on. So we have to think that how strong these institutions are, whether they need to have something different 
in their organizational setup or we have to some corrective uh, corrective action in with the within our uh, social inclusion strategy and uh, the whole host of uh, political uh, sensitization through panchayats the the role which it plays in uh, getting entitlements to this women self help group how well is it is working because we emphasize that it ultimately it is convergence and ability of, of these shgs to as a platform as a group of women who can leverage the rights which are uh, to which they are entitled to so whether these ethos this concept which we are having which we are pushing with all our state rural livelihood missions that this these should serve as a platform to leverage the resources which they and ideally a women should uh, get whether it is health it is icds it is sanitation toilets or whatever it be pensions whatever it be so that it will help us in strategizing this social inclusion thing also plus uh, to what extent we say we take this data from ccc data which uh, which takes which list out people on deprivation so we it will help us to understand that to what extent the social inclusion has been actualized in the group formation so these would be very interesting learning for us and i think this would help us to tweak our uh, responses to the uh, program per se great no oh, thanks very much uh, okay good all right, so uh, we have uh, room for four people. Okay, I'm sorry, that's all we have. So over here, of course, you raise your hand over here, over here, and then one back there. Yeah, that, that would be it. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Pamela. I represent an organization. Could you turn on the microphone? Is it? Very yes. Now. Okay. Uh, my question was for convergence, and uh, Lena Ma'am has already answered it. So uh, okay. that was Great. what I was looking for. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Shogini I'm from Population Council. Thank you, Vidisha and Rohan. It was an excellent overview. You can understand it how fast the work is. I, I would just like to point out, I have heard it before that, you know, when you reach to the field, you found that 30% SHGs are already defunct. And Ma'am has, Lina Ma'am has pointed out that you pulled up the data from MIS. Now, you know, like when we were at field in Bihar, we have figured out that uh, this SAG formation has been done in a like from a quick mandate within a stipulated timeline. You have to form these many SAGs. So one question is coming out from there is like financial sustainability or sustainability of SAGs uh, and quality of the SAGs. So are you planning to look at the bond rate of SAGs as well from your data? This is one question. Second is more like a comment like you have abandoned radiation discontinuity and you were planning to use DIT in terms of like early and late implementers in terms of blocks and your early is like 2003 while late is 2017 13. Right? 2013 yeah okay fine like it's a broad spectrum of time like at the same time you know like as the blocks are early or late implementers states are also early and late implementers so are you taking into account in your identification strategy like how like what level are you um, interpreting the result at the state level which is like not Maybe like you have a clearer plan, but it is not <coughs> clear. Like nine states, are you representing the results at the state level? How are you, how are you going to do it? Thank you very much. One last question. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to supplement what Lina and Gayatri mentioned, the question on Northeast and Hilly State. For Northeast, we have another program, World Bank supported, with the Northeastern Ministry, four states. That's also in the process of evaluation, which is just started. So maybe there's more learning from there on that. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, we're not, we don't have time for any more questions or comments. I'm going to ask each of the panelists, you have one minute, uh, each to come up with sort of your, your, your last statement that you want to leave uh, this, 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 uh, this audience. So first, Bidisha. Um, I'll, I'll respond to Sohini's questions. Uh, yes, we are looking at burn rates. We are looking at financial sustainability. So among all the humongous efforts that we have, we are also trying to access SAG books. And if you want to understand more about how painful that has been, please talk to Biswaranjan Baraj from Nielsen, who will vouch for the exercise that has been conducted in trying to access SAG books to understand their financial sustainability and viability. 
um, on the early and late and let. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, we are taking uh, in account that the states uh, can be early and late, but uh, since these all these states are from an RLP funded uh, states, uh, these states uh, started the implementation at the same time around 2012 uh, with a gap of same, um, not more than four or five months. <coughs> so, uh, that variation does not come into picture. It's majorly coming from the implementation when it started in blocks. Uh, talking about the, um, I mean, quality of uh, the SAGs that are there uh, on ground, uh, our question is, uh, do provide uh, good enough, I mean, good data on um, how the SAGs are functioning, how they have been functioning, how are they managing their finances, their meetings, how the group dynamics takes place, and also, uh, uh, how they are uh, moving beyond just the financial aspects, but uh, towards more uh, village-level uh, group dynamics. So first, uh, apologies that we didn't get to other questions that I know are burning. Uh, so I hope you can catch our panel before they go off uh, for your, your questions. The other thing that I, I want to say is that uh, please stay for another five minutes or so. Uh, because uh, we have a great presentation from Vidisha, which I'll uh, uh, let you do in, in, a, in a minute. In a two, uh, <laughs> but first, uh, let, let me just uh, say uh, how pleased I am uh, to have had uh, the opportunity to chair this uh, to chair this panel. I think, I think what you heard today was uh, what some of us would call a real world evaluation. It's not in a laboratory. It's not even uh, a, a pilot. Uh, one of the things that's really impressive about this is this is a, an evaluation of a very large, and as, as you pointed out, Gaijin and Lina, ongoing program uh, of uh, a country. And I think what this is showing is that it's really possible to do this in a very rigorous way, uh, which I think is truly important because uh, there are people who are concerned that a lot of the evaluation research that's going on is about small little pilots. They're worried about uh, whether or not it's applicable elsewhere. Here's a real example of a very large ongoing program and how, how important it is to do, this, uh, to do this well. I'm very pleased that we have here uh, both the researchers as well as the implementers and the policy makers and the program people uh, to have this conversation. So uh, before I turn it over to Vidisha, please join me in thanking the panel for what's been a tremendous uh,